join me in welcoming to the stage Monica Campana. Okay. Um, so street art has the power to connect, engage, and humanize our public spaces. In the past three years, I have witnessed blank walls transform into places for dialogue, reflection, and even necessary conflict. I can say firsthand that street art changed the way I saw my city. And in fact, it made me fall in love with a city that I never thought I could call home. What I'm here to do today is to talk to you about the role of street art in our public space. Now, everyone here knows what a great public, pla public place looks like. It looks a lot like this. It has people out there. It has people out on the streets, not because there's a neighborhood festival, but because they want to be there. There is an obvious relationship between pedestrians and buildings. Businesses have hand-painted signs, and even the light poles have character and meaning. A good public place is a place with pride, and it's a place that is worth caring about. A long time ago, I was lucky to discover a TED Talk by James Howard Kunstler. It is called The Tragedy of Suburbia. And he says that he wants to live in a city that is worth caring about with places that are meaningful, with character and quality. When I heard this, it really hit me. And it hit me because we happen to live in a city that has its fair share of tragic public places, like this one. And we all seem to be OK living in not so happy public places. Our abandoned streets, neglected walls, create spaces like this one. Our poorly designed highways that cut straight through the heart of the city makes it very difficult for us to be able to connect with our surroundings. And how can we if we're going so fast? Our obsession with driving is driving us right out of the ability to connect with our surroundings. Our poorly designed public places bring crime rates higher, property value lower, and businesses, not so many. It looks like a scene from The Walking Dead, does it? Well, the TV show The Walking Dead chose Atlanta's downtown for its post-apocalyptic setting. <laughs> now, this is a problem, and we have to fix this. We are going so fast that we are forgetting about where we come from. We're forgetting about our historic spaces. In fact, Sweet Auburn District here in Atlanta is considered a landmark in danger of extinction. Again, this is a problem, and we have to change this. So let me back up and tell you more about me. I have an accent, if you guys have not noticed. I'm not from here. I'm from Lima, Peru. And I moved here in 1998. I was 15 years old, and I was not the happiest person when I moved here. I grew up with plazas and parks, and I grew up enjoying being outside with my family. Maybe because we didn't have much inside our homes, but, well, that's how I grew up. I remember having block parties almost every month and knowing everyone in my neighborhood. Everyone in my block was family. I had a sense of space. I knew where I belonged, and I knew where I was coming from. And as an artist, I happened to get inspired a lot by my surroundings. Needless to say, I was not very happy when I moved to Atlanta. I was lost. And I moved here to go to art school. So I go to art school, and then I drop out, and then I go to another one, and then I dropped out again. I was just not OK. I was losing my sense of space. But luckily, one day, thanks to the internet, I find this, and it blew my mind. I'm like, who is this? How did he do this? Was this done legally or illegally? Where is this ad? So the artist, his name is Blue. He's from Italy. And the wall is located in Berlin. And somehow, I felt more connection 3,000 miles away from this wall than what I felt in my own city. I was inspired. I wanted to make art. But I didn't want to make art for a gallery. I wanted to make art for the streets. I wanted to be able to connect with others the same way that this man connected with me. At this point, I meet another artist who had been in the same boat with me. We were not very happy with the art scene here in Atlanta. And we decided to take our art to the streets. Art was fun. 
It was great. I saw myself in a whole new world. And, and I was now seeing my streets and my buildings and my city differently. And I became a wall collector. And this is for real. I will go, bike around, walk around, document walls, touch the walls, as crazy as that may sound, because I needed to see if that will work for, my, for the artwork that I wanted to put on those. Now I'm seeing my city in a completely different way, and I'm connecting with it, and I loved it. Now I'm seeing buildings and thinking, do I need to reactivate this space? How many people will see this space? Our city was our canvas, and our audience, limitless. How many people can I connect with today? In this process, I meet this very important person. His name is Blackie Lee Rudy Migliosi, and he does have a really long name. He was going to tech. He's a math guy. But Blackie had done a study abroad in Barcelona, and he knew all of this awesome street artists from Spain. So we had a lot in common. We liked street art. He moved back to, well, he came back to Atlanta, and he did a project on urbanism. He was walking a lot, biking a lot, taking every Marita bus and Marita lane. He was walking the Beltline. Um, so we, we had a lot to talk about. We were both seeing our cities differently. And one day we come up with this idea, really crazy idea that we proposed to a nonprofit, an arts nonprofit in Atlanta called iDrum. The idea revolved around the question of, what if we put graffiti writers and street artists together in the same room with city planners and urbanists? Crazy. These guys went to school for it, and this ones didn't. What if we put these two together and make them talk? And what if we bring the best street artists in the world to Atlanta, to the South, <coughs> to change our landscape? What if? IDRAM loved the idea, and so Living Walls the City Speaks, a conference on street art and urbanism, is born. Now we just had to figure out how to get those artists we promised that we were going to get. But we started to ask everyone. And we were asking people from Spain and Germany and Canada and Peru and Argentina. I mean, why not? We had nothing to lose. And everyone started to say, yes, we want to be part of this. We want to be part of it, and we want to work with your local artists to challenge this question. What are these buildings communicating to us? And what are these buildings communicating to you? Is this telling you I'm just a pile of bricks and we're never going to be friends? I'm here and you're there. Does it make you feel like you have much power to do anything on that, huh? And are we even caring about this? What is this saying about us? Why are we not doing something about this? Not much positive in these walls either. They're probably the saddest looking walls, and we are okay having this sort of inspiration around us. Not much positive. Let me tell you a story about this wall. Earlier this year, a woman named Yolanda came to me, and she tells me that she wants for us to paint a mural on her wall. And she tells me, this building has gone through a lot of things, and it really needs to be cleansed. This building went through robberies, attacks, and even people got murdered. This woman, when I meet her, she's the most colorful, most amazing, positive person you'll ever meet in your life, but she owns a building that happened to have the worst energy possible, and she wanted to change that. And so I introduced her to the artist I was going to paint on the wall, and this is what happens. It's a really pretty picture. It's an elephant, represents power, overcoming obstacles. It has a tree in the back, the tree of life. But aside from being just a really beautiful mural, this wall was produced in a matter of 10 days with the help of the kids in the neighborhood. So this is not just Yolanda's wall anymore. Now this is the neighborhood's wall. Now it's something that everyone around feels some sort of pride on. Now we are connecting with people. How are we really connecting with something like this? This wall sits right next to the penitentiary here in Atlanta, Georgia, in the Chosewood Park neighborhood, in front of a mosque and in front of a church. I invited the artist Hiro from Argentina to paint 
this wall. And when she got here, she paints this. It is a woman that is growing fur. And this coat of fur, she later starts to shed, and it becomes a wolf. And now she's walking on the nude with this wolf next to her. It's transformation or change. I see it as something really positive. But not everyone in the neighborhood saw it as that. Some people liked it, and some people thought it was pornographic. There was a big discussion there. So me and the artist stepped back. What went on the wall now belongs to everyone, and now everyone gets to decide what happens to it. The wall, unfortunately, was painted over. They did not want the wall there. But street art is supposed to be ephemeral. It's not supposed to last. But what will always last is the story. And for the first time, a wall that was neglected for so many years, it is now the story for not only people in the Chosewood Park neighborhood, in the Chosewood Park neighborhood, or Atlanta, or this country. Now it lives in the, in the mind of so many people in the world. We connect it. These walls not only belong to living walls, it belongs to the community. It belongs to everyone that gets to be part of it. And they're not meant to, they're not meant to answer questions. They're meant to raise questions. And once you start talking about them, the paint that was on the wall now creates a dialogue and it creates now public space. And now this public space becomes more human. And so now we are part of something we never thought we could be part of. We can play with our walls. We are allowed to play with our surroundings. And once you do, you can come up with something this beautiful. And you can play very big. You can let your voice be heard, 18 stories high big. Don't ever feel that you cannot, even if it's that scary. Over the past three years, Living Walls has painted over 75 walls in the city of Atlanta, Miami, Florida, and Albany, New York. And we have worked with a number of artists from different parts of the world for free. The funniest thing, well, most amazing thing, is that now Atlanta is considered a hub for street art. The South, it is considered as the home for street art in the world. It's in Atlanta. There's no street art in Atlanta, right? That's uh, as far as I knew. So uh, I ended up, you know, I, I get the stories uh, as people started coming back from Gaia and Jordan Seiler and these guys, and they were all like, this is the craziest, most awesome conference that you could possibly have. And it is all volunteer based. This is all made with a lot of heart and with a lot of passion because it's fun, because we made art fun. much you have to get very resourceful you have to learn how to share since we don't have much to offer to the artists and everything is free we have to feed them we have to give them breakfast lunch and dinner not only to the artists but also to the volunteers some like to eat more than the others like that one over there he loves to eat. Every picture looks like that. Yesterday I, I peeked out of my store and I seen the artists working on the wall. Art needs to be displayed to bring out something, you know, of, of of uh, positivity in the community, especially when people come off that train, they need to be able to see something that, you know, can kind of enlighten them, make them think to some degree. The 
This is all footage from this year's conference. That's why it highlights females. For the first time, we decided to also talk about gender role in public space, which is something that people don't like to really talk about much. When you look back, all the hard work that we put into this, it's moments like this one that makes it all worthwhile. When you look back at the work, you take it all in. For the past three years, I have been working towards promoting and educating and changing perspectives about our public space via street art. And it's a very difficult task, especially when you have so much gray and so much power telling you it is hard to raise your voice. But if you do decide to take back your public space and let your voice be heard, believe me, I'll shine brighter than the, than the rest. Just like that picture shows it. So I'm standing here in front of you guys, and finally I can tell you that I found home. Thank you. Thank you.